and haven't had a chance to connect with someone on our team, we'd love to meet you. If you're joining us today in person, after the experience, head to the connections wall in our lobby to meet some of our pastoral team and volunteers in blue shirts. They are ready to answer any questions you may have and to help you find a way to get connected here at Central. And if you're joining us online, we'd love to hear from you. Let us know where you're watching from, and we invite you to reach out to our online hosts in the chat window with any questions you may have. We want everyone to be a part of what is happening here today. Here at Central, our vision is simple, helping you connect with God and each other. Everything we do here, from our Sunday experience and groups to our kids and youth programs, revolves around those two things. Today, to help you connect with God, we want to encourage you to open your heart to experience God's love for you as we worship together. Connection to God can look different for everyone, but we want you to know this is a safe place for you to explore your faith and relationship with Him. Then, to help you connect with others, we have groups. Our groups are designed with you in mind and how we can best serve you in your next steps. So to ensure we have something for everyone, we have four types of groups here at Central. Community groups, small groups, interest groups, and support groups. Each group is led by a leader committed to helping you connect to God and others on the same journey. In fact, we are just a few weeks away from launching our fall groups. Starting September 7th, we have the return of our community group, A Place For You. And on October 2nd, we are excited to have the Alpha starting again. If you're new to faith or would like a safe place to ask questions about who Jesus is and why he's worth following, then Alpha is the group for you. Over 24 million people from around the world have joined this life-changing eight-week program. If you'd like more information about either of these groups, head over to centralcc.ca slash groups or head to the connections wall after today's experience. And someone from our team will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, summer is coming to an end. The kids are almost ready to head back to school and we are just two weeks away for our fall kickoff. Be sure to join us September 11th as we celebrate the unofficial start of fall and more importantly, the launch of our fall programming. We will have a number of opportunities for you to find ways to get connected throughout the month of September. So join us outside that day after a 9 and 11 a.m. experience for Bouncy Castles, for the kids, and for the chance to check out all the different ministries we have available for you and your family this fall. Everything from kids and youth programs to community groups and interest groups. We will also have some fun food options available for you and your family to enjoy all morning. It's going to be a great day connecting together with our our church family as we kick off the fall. We also want to let you know of an exciting event we have coming up on Sunday, September 18th. Join us for a night of worship with singer-songwriter Pat Barrett. Pat is an award-winning worship leader known for songs such as Build My Life and Good Good Father, and we are so excited for the opportunity to be a part of his upcoming Canadian tour. It will be an inspiring night of worship you don't want to miss out. For more information and to purchase tickets, please visit UniteProductions.com. If you have any questions about anything we've mentioned today, you can text our number at 905-937-5610 or visit our website centralcc.ca slash connect. It's your best resource to stay updated on everything we've talked about today. You can also scan that QR code on the seat back in front of you to complete a connection card. And as always, you can head out to the connections wall following the experience as we'd love to have a conversation and help in any way we can. So that's all for me today. Our experience is about to begin. I invite you to stand with me if you are able as we worship together. <laughs> wow, good morning. It's so good to be here today. I, do you agree? Thank you for joining us online as well. We're going to worship together. So I just want to encourage you. We're singing to honor God. So let's do that. Let's lift our voices, raise our hands, put our hands together.
one who was, is, and is to come. That's you, our Heavenly Father. God through the ages, the same yesterday, today, tomorrow. That's the God we love. That's the God we worship, sing to. You. Thank you, God. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. Calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same thing for me. Do the same for me, my God. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God. your children then you hear your children now you are the same God you are the same God you answered prayers back then, and you will answer now you are the same God you are the same God you were providing providing now you are the same
Oh 
presence today and I hope you are too um, maybe I can share a little bit about how God's been faithful in my life a little bit and I think everyone in this room can relate to in the last few years there's been lots of changes lots of moving parts lots of challenges and, and decisions to be made and I've lost some people in my life I've changed locations I've changed jobs um, I was at home for eight to ten weeks doing absolutely nothing away from church, just like everyone here. And there's been many, many opportunities for the enemy to interfere and keep us home. But everybody here today is here because of God's faithfulness. Of course. Yeah. So I hope that encourages you. And I, God, I just want to pray. I just want to pray for those that are here today that maybe don't necessarily feel your presence yet. <laughs> that they need you. Would you remind them that they are loved, appreciated, cared for, and that they belong here? There wasn't a day that you weren't by my side. There wasn't a day that you let me fall. And with all of my life, your love has been true forever. And with all of my life, I will worship you because you've been the same God yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and you will never change. And we love you, God. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for singing today, this morning. It's going to be a wonderful service. Uh, please take a seat and as we continue. great here. I can hear you back there. It's awesome. It is awesome. You know, there's something I've learned in my life, and it's simply this. It isn't over until it's over. It isn't over until it's over, and only God gets to decide when that is. I've seen this in my life in coaching. Uh, in our championship game last season, uh, our opponent only needed one point to win. One point. And in that timeout, I remember thinking, you know what? This is not over. It looked like it was over, but it was not over. Our team scored five unanswered points and won the championship. It is not over until it's over. But I've also seen it in my personal life. I don't know what it's like you, uh, for you, those of you who are married, but those first few, first few years with Carlene and I weren't always easy. And if I'm totally transparent and honest, it's awesome now. <laughs> but back then, there were times when I'm like, I don't know if this is over. But what I've learned is it isn't over until it's over and God alone gets to decide that. I even saw it with this building. If I had seriously given a dollar for every time someone came into my office in the last 10 years and said, I just don't think we're gonna get that permit. I just don't think that we're gonna be able to do it this here. I just don't think this is going to happen. And yet here we are sitting in this place because it's not over until it's over and God gets to decide when that is. And I woke up this morning fired up because I knew that some of you would be coming into this place like me and you would be thinking that there's something that is over in your life. Maybe you come into this place today and you are in a relationship that is fractured. 
and it's hanging on by a thread. And everything around you tells you it's over. I am here to tell you that it is not over until it's over and God alone gets to determine that. There are some of you who came into this place today and you look at your financial statement and you see inflation increasing. And you think to yourself, I, I just, I think it's over. I don't think I can make ends meet. I cannot pay the bills. And you think it's over. I'm here to tell you, it is not over until it's over and God alone gets to determine that. There are even some of you in this place and you've received a diagnosis or someone you love has received a diagnosis and it looks like it's over. It's not over until it's over and God alone determines that. And that's what I wanna talk to you about today as we continue in week four of our series, Heroes and Villains. Today, we're gonna talk about Samson. And if you've read the story before found in Judges 13 to 16, you might question whether he really is a hero or if he's a villain. Because sometimes, actually most of the time, he acts more like a villain than a hero, but there's something powerful in this story that we can all take away with us. And it's this, it's not over until it's over and God alone gets to determine that. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Judges chapter 13. If you don't have your Bible, that's okay. It will be on the screens, but we're gonna go through this story pretty quickly. And I know I'm gonna be doing that, so I'm anticipating that. So I'm just telling you, if there's something you're like, wow, I wanna learn more about that, read it. It's right there. It's easy. Judges 13 to 16, three chapters. It'll take you literally 15 minutes. But here's what the story begins with. In chapter 13, verse one, it says, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now this particular phrase is used four times in the book of Judges. And as a matter of fact, in chapter 21, verse 25, the summary of the book of Judges, it says, in those days, Israel had no king and everyone did as they saw fit. Here's the dilemma. Israel has come out of slavery, out of Egypt, They've taken the promised land. Now there are uh, tribes scattered in the promised land. They have no king, but invading forces keep coming and oppressing them. But they don't trust God. <laughs> they do what they think is right. They try to fix it on their own. I know none of you are like this. They try to fix it on their own, solve it. They brainstorm. They, they go to sessions to, to chart it all out and they never actually ask God, God, what do you want me to do? And as a result, it says, so the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. That number 40 comes up all throughout the Bible. You cannot miss it. That number 40 means to test. It's the people walking through the wilderness. It's Jesus in the wilderness in his temptation. It's Noah in the ark. That number 40 continually pops up as a numeric device to remind us that there are gonna be seasons in our life when we are tested. But I think the interesting thing about this story is I don't think God is testing us, I think we test God. You think God's testing you? No, you're testing God because if you did it God's way, we learned this in week number one, God has a way the world is supposed to work. And when you get outside of that, it is evil. Now this word evil, you know, we think of mass murderers, we think of, you know, psychos, but that's not the word in Hebrew. The word in Hebrew simply means to go bad or to go wrong. It's an image of an apple that's been plucked from the branch. As soon as that is disconnected, it begins to die, right? An apple begins to die. Or think of a, a hiker in the woods loses their way. They lost their way. It's really bad. This is the Hebrew word. And it's a reminder at the very beginning of this chapter that when you refuse to do it God's way, you lose your way. You get disconnected from the source of life. And as a result, oppression comes in. These Philistines, they were literally like barbarians of the ancient world, Vikings. They were raiders who came from the sea. They were the sea people. And the sea, again, the waters in the Bible often represents chaos. The point is simple that when you refuse to go God's way, you invite chaos into your life. You see, it's really easy to read this story and get nitpicky on all the deals, all the things that are happening, but this story is a mirror. Yes, it's a story about a man named Samson, but it's about you and it's about me. And it reminds us that when we don't trust God, things go wrong. But in God's mercy, he raises judges. They're not kings yet. I think that's an interesting term, judges. So they're kind of like tribal leaders. 
but they're judges because they deliver the nation of Israel, but they also expose the problem of Israel. They're there to judge, to say, listen, when you don't do it God's way, this is where you find yourself, and, and this is the bad news, and then we're gonna get to the really good news. A lot of times we find ourselves in a place we don't wanna be simply because we didn't trust God, and we got disconnected, and we did what we thought was right in our eyes. We did what we thought felt good or what was really inconvenient right now, and we lost sight. We got lost in the woods. We got separated from the source of life. But God in his mercy chooses a deliverer and his name is Samson. His name literally means man of the sun, S-U-N. That's gonna be really important in a minute because he was meant to be a light. And his mother, we don't even know her name uh, because this isn't a story about her, it's about us and what God wants to do. She is barren. And in the ancient world, that was considered a curse by God because you wouldn't have children to take care of you in your old age. You wouldn't be able to carry on your family name and your family line. And so like many in the Bible, she was barren, crying out to God and God answers her prayer. And it says the woman gave birth to a boy and she named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him. And I love this verse that it says, and the spirit of the Lord began to stir in him. Here's the interesting thing that this morning, I just believe that the Spirit of God is going to stir in some of you again. Some of you who thought it was over, it's going to stir in you again. And what happens when you stir something on the pot, right? All the good bits that have fallen to the bottom get stirred back up to the top. And that's what's going to happen for some of you today. Some of you, it's been so long since you felt God's power in His presence. It's been so long since you trusted Him audaciously to do something in your life that you believe the narrative, it is over. And God's going to stir in you today and the good things are going to come back to the surface. And you're going to be reminded that God is a deliverer. He is a savior. He is a healer. He is a restorer. He is a redeemer. It is not over until it's over. And only God gets to say when that is. But this child was going to be special. And so this child was going to take a Nazarite vow. In the ancient world, again, there were a group of people called the Nazarites. Um, they would take a vow. Most of them would only take it for a short period of time in dedication to God. But Samson was to be dedicated from the time he was born because he had a divine purpose, just like you do. Whether you know it or not, whether you woke up understanding this or not, you have a divine purpose. God knit you together in your mother's womb. From the time you were conceived, you think maybe it was your mom and dad one romantic night? It was actually God working through history and generations. I know, gross. I was through generations to bring you to this place right now. There is a divine purpose for you. And when things have a divine purpose, they're special. And so the Nazarite vow was, you weren't supposed to touch anything that was dead because you were a symbol of life. You weren't supposed to touch anything from the grapevine, actually grapes at all, because it could cloud your thinking. And Samson was never supposed to cut his luscious hair, his glorious, beautiful hair. And if you grew up in Sunday school, you saw like a Herculean man with this beautiful mane of hair. The power was not in his hair. The power was in the promise of God. And his hair was simply a reminder that he had been chosen by God to deliver his people. He's not going to understand that. No one in the story is going to understand that, but God knew it. He was chosen, and so are you. You say, well, how do you know that, Bill? You don't know me. You don't know my story. You don't know what I'm feeling. No, I know, but I know God. And I know that God stirs, and I know God is stirring some of you even now, and I promise you that stirring is gonna intensify. I know even now things are starting to bubble up again. Maybe that's, it's that dream, right, that you thought is over. My past has defined me. My limitation has defined me. It is not over. And the spirit that was in Samson is the same spirit that is in you and I. You don't believe me? Let me show you from the Bible. Ezekiel 38, God says, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I know what happens, your heart becomes hard by life, but I will take that heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you. In 1 Peter 2, 9, 
we're reminded you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into the wonderful light, his wonderful light. And John, Jesus in his prayer said, as you sent me to the world, I sent them, speaking of us, into the world. For, that, for this I sanctify myself, that they too may be sanctified. What does this word sanctified mean? It means simply to be set apart. That word holy doesn't mean perfect or to do all the external things right. It means to be set apart for a special purpose. In the ancient world, fire was a game changer. It really was. Fire, now you could cook, you could see. Of course, we know that fire is powerful and when contained is beautiful. But if you've ever seen a forest fire, and I have, you know that fire uncontained or a house fire is incredibly destructive. The point is that your life is so much more powerful than fire. Your life has divine purpose and when it is contained by the ordinance and law of God, it is powerful for the good. But without restraint, it just causes destruction. So Jesus would say it this way, you're a light. You don't take a light and put it under a bowl. You're a salt, you're like salt. You bring flavor to the world, but when you lose your saltiness, it's just thrown out on to the street. What I walked away with is that once you lose what makes you different, you lose the power to bring transformation. Maybe you feel powerless. Maybe you believe it is over. But I'm here to tell you that it's not over because God can transform you by his spirit if you allow him. So the spirit is stirring in Samson, but Samson is impulsive. That is probably the greatest understatement that there is. I mean, Samson only runs on emotion. He sees, he wants, he gets. Samson was like, me see, me like, me want, me take. That was Samson's whole life. Everything he wanted, what looked good to him, hey, bring it on, even though it went against his vow, the promise God had for him. And so it says in chapter 14, verse one, Samson went down to Timnah. Now, whenever you read the term down in the Bible, that simply means away from God. Jonah went down, Elijah went down. It's when you walk away from God. Even though Samson had God's spirit stirring in him, he ignored it. He exchanged it for his whims and his passions and his desires for the moment. If I were to describe North American culture, that would be it. Take what you want, what you see, what you desire. At whatever cost, this is Samson's downfall. And he sees a young Philistine woman, and I'm sure she was pretty, and I'm sure she was intelligent, but Deuteronomy, it was pretty clear he was not supposed to be, have anything to do with her. But Samson said to his father, get her for me. She's the right one for me. Who told him that? He did. In the English Standard Version, it says, I see this as being right in my eyes. And so Samson is ruled by emotion. Now I'm gonna go through a whirlwind here of the story. It is crazy, like it is crazy. If you've not read it in a while, you gotta read it again. But here's what happens. So Samson marries this Philistine girl. At their wedding party, they bring all of a bunch of guests and to get there, he had to go once, first time to meet her through a vineyard, not supposed to be in a vineyard. A lion jumps out and attacks him. The spirit of God, it gives him the power to kill this lion with his bare hands. He leaves it dead, number two, strike. And as he goes back the next time, there's honey in this dead lion's mouth. So he takes the honey, eats it because it was pleasing to him, gives it to his parents, doesn't tell them because he knows they'll disapprove. He breaks all of the vows except for his gorgeous hair. He's still got his gorgeous hair, so hey, we got things going on. So he goes to the party and he gives this riddle to 30 men. He says, if you can solve the riddle and he's talking about the lion, you'll have to read it for yourself in the Bible. I will give you each a tunic, a new outfit. But if you can't get it, then you have to give me each an outfit, 30 outfits. He's also a gambler. He's a gambler in every way, including his life, his conscience, conscience and his purpose. So they can't solve it. So for seven days, seven days, his honeymoon, every night 
His wife cries because the Philistines came to her and said, if you don't find this out for us, we're gonna kill you and your father. The Philistines are nasty, nasty, nasty. And so every night for seven nights, she cries. It's the oldest trick in the book. Uh, Samson, you want what you want, then you gotta give me what I want. That's how it works here. And for seven nights, and he can't take it anymore, so he tells her the riddle, the answer. And they come back to him and they say, give him the answer and, and one of the greatest lines in the Bible he says if you had not taken my heifer and plowed in my field you would have not had my answer that is such a great line for another time but he is so furious that in a rage he goes and he slaughters 30 men takes their clothes I can just see this picture these bloody folded clothes and he goes there there's your tunic there's your tunic and he runs off in a rage again well, he goes off, and so his father-in-law says, well, he must not want his wife anymore. So in the meantime, his father-in-law marries his daughter, Samson's wife, to another guy. He comes back. After he's cooled down, he's going to go into the bedchamber, it says. I'll let you fill in the blanks. And his father says, no, no, you can't go in there. She's married to another man. He loses his mind. It says he takes 300 foxes, he ties their tails with fire and sets them loose on the fields. And of course, in an agricultural economy, that was a devastating Low. They find out who did it, the Philistines, and they go and they kill his father-in-law and his, what used to be his wife, now married to another guy, burn them alive in a house. He is so furious that he meets them in a valley and with the jawbone of an ass, he's acting like one, but he takes the jawbone of a donkey, a dead donkey, and he kills a thousand of them. You can see this going from like 30 to 300 to a thousand. Here's, here's the point. Compromise and sin will compound on itself. Just like compound interest works in finance, you put money in the bank, it builds on itself, it's the same with sin. And Samson was on a slippery slope, he was on a path with destruction, his own, and he didn't care because he thought he was successful. Every time he needed it, he had his strength. And I walked away from this thinking, never confuse success with purpose. Never confuse success with purpose. You can have success today. Oh, I got away with it today. You can even have success in this world, but if you are not living in your purpose, you are on a perilous path. And so it continues. You can read about it. He shacks up with another prostitute. They try to tie him in the city. He rips off the gates and walks off with them. It's like crazy, crazy stuff. But it ends with Delilah. Oh, Delilah, the villain in our story. Delilah seduces him, and as you've seen, he is a pretty easy target. Uh, she seduces him, and she's going to use him to trap, she's going to try to figure out his secret to his strength so that she can trap him. And Delilah in this story, again, if we use it as a mirror, is anything you allow into your life that oppresses you. Anything that allows you allow into your life that promises you everything, but on the back end wants to take everything. It's many of the vices, habits, thoughts that we allow ourselves to indulge in. We're not willing to pay the sacrifice. We're not willing to pay the cost. We're not willing to live in the promise of God. And so we settle for Delilah. Her name in the Hebrew is a play on words, which means night. And so the sun born, man of the sun, is now fully in the darkness of the night. And again, she tricks him. Uh, she pleads with him to tell her his secret to his strength. And he refuses three times. And I, I think, okay, if you haven't caught on already, Samson is thick. I mean, he is super thick. Uh, I don't care how big his biceps are, his brain is dull. And he doesn't clue in like three times. She tries to trap him and every time he's like, oh, okay. And he tells her again. Finally, she is fed up. And then she said to him, how can you say I love you? when you won't confide in me. <laughs> At this point, if I'm Samson, I say, how can you say you love me when I've told you three times and you've tried to kill me? <laughs> nope, not Samson. We can all be a little thick, can't we? I'm bigger than this. I can beat this. This won't get me. Other weaker people maybe, but not me. I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm great, actually. I got this. No, you don't. 
This is the third time you've made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. And with such nagging. <laughs> I love that. There it is right in the Bible. As a matter of fact, again, this is not Bill, this is Bible. Better to live on a roof than with a nagging wife. I'm just saying, that's the Bible. Uh, with nagging. I just made a few enemies. It's okay. <laughs> nagging, she pr- pr- <laughs> prodded him. I love this. It's like, like the, an ox. She's just poking him day after day after day after day until he was sick to death of it. Well, he shouldn't have been there in the first place. It's his fault he's there. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I'd become as weak as any other man. One of the most powerful life lessons I've learned, and it's held me in really difficult times, is do not compromise what matters most for what you want right now. There are times when life will entice you with what looks like a way out. Hey, hey, this is a way out of the responsibility of taking care of your family. Oh, hey, hey, this is the way out of that pain. This is the way out, but it's a trap door. It is bait. And Samson takes it, he forgets why he exists. He loses his purpose, and all he wants is what feels good right now. And as we learned in week number two with Justin, he bargains with his future, and his future is grim. So she shaves his head, and the Philistines come, and he jumps up and thinks, I can do this again, just like you did. You thought, oh, I got away with it five times. I can do it the sixth time. You thought, hey, no one caught me. No one understood. Hey, this is great. I've done this 10 times. I can do it an 11th. Whatever that is, he jumps up and believes that he can do it again. But it says the spirit had left him. He'd become disconnected from the source, lost in the darkness. And the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. He could no longer see the future. He could no longer see what was right in front of him. He had lost his vision, not just physically, but in every way. They bound him with bronze shackles. You know that feeling of being bound to something or someone. And they set him to grinding grain in a prison. He was just walking in circles. And the warning for all of us in this story is that if we refuse to live in God's way, I know sometimes people try to tell you it's oppressive or it's limiting, but it's the absolute absolute opposite truth. Everything else is simply bait and switch. Everything else is a trap door. Everything else is a hook created to lure you into the darkness. And if we give in, we find ourselves with no vision. I can't see any way out. Bound to our circumstance. Believing we'll be a slave. Walking in circles mundanely day after day after day. And getting nowhere. This is our story. Whenever you read the word but in the Bible. You should pay attention. Every time you read the the word but, you should circle it and underline it because it says, even though he was in this desperate state, even though it looked like it was over, in verse 22 it says, but the hair on his head began to grow again. Oh. Oh, this, this is what I woke up with today for you. Maybe you've come into this place and you think it's over. Maybe you've allowed your past to define you. I know that story. I know the lie that Bill, remember what you did? Yes, I do. I know what I was. 
That lie says, Bill, you'll never be able to break through in this area. I don't care how big your dream, there's no way it's impossible. You walked into this place today believing it is over. But with God, it is never over. It is never over. And I want to speak into your life today that the hair can grow again. I claimed that here first, but I claimed it here second. I want the hair to grow again. God, God, I pray with Samson and the only prayer, the only prayer recorded, the only time Samson actually talks to God, does anything with God is this final prayer. They, they bring him blind and bound and broken into the temple of Dagon, the very seat, the foundation of a worldview that was corrupt and destructive. And they put his hands on the pillars. He says to the young boy, put your hands there, the foundation of what is holding this faulty worldview up. And he looks up and he prays his prayer. God, remember me, please. Remember me. I know who I am. I know what I've done. I know I don't deserve it. I know I'm here because of my own choice, my consequences, but God, remember me. And just one more time, God, just one more time. And I know, I know what sin does. I know how you feel at night when no one is around and those voices haunt you. Those images torment you. They had brought him into that temple to make fun of him, to make sport of him. And your past says, look at what you are. Loser, failure, sinner, broken. Look at what you've done. You're worthless. You'll never amount to anything. It is over for you, Samson. It is over. It is so over. But God, and this is our prayer today, remember. God hadn't forgotten. God never forgets. God was right there. He just wanted to be invited back in. God is willing to connect you at any moment. He is simply a breath away. And so Samson cried out, God, one more time. And today, some of you, you need to pray that prayer of desperation, God, just one more time. Give me the courage to stand up for what is right. God, one more time, break this addiction in my life. God, one more time, help me to be kind and bring freedom to my family. God, one more time, in your mercy, heal me. God, one more time, one more time. And with a mighty shout, I can just imagine it, a life that looked like it had been a total waste in that last moment finds victory. I can see the smile on Samson's face as he's like, God is never done with us. I will deliver my people, I will. And what I've learned is that when you get right with God, God helps you get it right with the world. When you get right with God, and some of you today, this is your first time in church. You're like, whoa, where's this guy from? I'll tell you where I'm from, where you were. And I'm fighting for you today. And some of you, that, that dream has died. It needs to get stirred up again. I'm here to stir it up if I can. I'm here to tell you the truth that it is never over until it's over and only God gets to decide that. And so... It's never too late. I want to speak to those of you who are in the twilight years of your life. And you think your best years are behind you. It's over. Oh, no, that is nonsense. That is a lie. Push against those pillars. Break them down. It is never too late. Some of you feel like every choice you've made has been a disaster and you'll never make a good choice. That is a lie. Put your hands against those pillars and begin to push. Some of you in this place think I can never do what God called me to do. He called me when I was a kid, but I've lost my way. I forgot. Put your hands on those lies and pray. God, just one more time. One more time. Even if it's just for today, even if it's just for an hour, even if it's just for a minute, one more time. 
and push, push. Huh. That is how you live in victory. And so when I was here early praying and prepping in my office up there, I, I heard the worship team singing that second song, God, the God of Jacob, the God of David, the God of Mary, and I knew that's it. For some of you today, that was your song. You didn't know it the first time we sang it, so we're gonna sing it again. But today we're gonna stand. And some of you, you're gonna need to shout, it's okay. Some of you gonna need to raise your hands, it's okay. Some of you are gonna need tears just to fall down your face, it's okay. We're not gonna worry about what's happening around us because right now is your moment to put your hands on the pillars of those lies that have shackled you and push. And we're gonna sing. I mean, we are gonna sing. We are gonna raise the roof in declaration that God, it is not over. I don't care what my past says. I don't care what my mistakes tell me. I don't care what I feel or what I think. I know what I thought was right in my own eyes and my eyes have been gouged out. I am looking to you just one more time, one more time for my mind, for my heart, for my family, for my nation, one more time. Stir in me your purpose again, one more time. It's never too late to do what is right and to allow God to make it right in this world. Let's stand and sing. Thank you, God. You're not done with us yet. Calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who.
you heard your children then you hear your children now you are the same God. yes you are you are the same God you answer prayers by them and you will answer now you are the same God say it again you are the same God you were providing you always do you are providing now you are the same God let's lift it up you are the same moment of recognizing, God, I need you right now, one more time. God, one more time, I need you to fill me. God, one more time, I need your strength. And throughout this room, I don't know what you walked in here with, but I know that the same God of the Bible, the same God of Samson is here prepared to strengthen you. And so together, I just want to proclaim one more time, one more time in our families, maybe one more time in your finances, one more time trusting that actually we serve a God who wants the very best for you one more time. And for some of you, this may be the thousandth time you're saying one more time, God, one more time, I'm ready now, I trust you. Or maybe it's the first time, and either way, I need you to know the God of Mary, of David, the same God who healed then can heal now, the same God who provided then can provide now. So we pray together one more time, one more time. Would you just pray with me? Jesus, I just recognize that alone, I can't do it. Jesus, I just recognize that alone, I can't do it. So I'm done pushing in my own strength, God. One more time, I need you. God, I need you now. So throughout this place, God, I just pray for healing, God, for for financial situations to be handed over to you, for family to heal, God, because we no longer do it on our own. We partner with you and we say one more time, God, help me. Give me strength, give me courage, give me wisdom. And in your name we pray, amen. I don't know, like I said, where you are on this journey of faith. And we recognize that for all of us, it might be very different. And so if this is the first time and you just have questions about what does it even mean to follow Jesus? How do I even go about it? First of all, I just wanna encourage you, uh, we're here to partner with you. Here at Central, honestly, our our vision, our goal, it's really simple. We wanna help you connect to God and connect to people. And so if you're here today and you just need to know 
what it looks like or, or why we even follow Jesus, I would encourage you, send us a text. Just text the word central to 905-937-5610. And we would love to get connected with you. Answer any questions you have, have a conversation because we just believe that when we truly pray that prayer of one more time, God is gonna come and he's gonna provide, he will strengthen. And we wanna help on that journey in any way that we can. Uh, a second thing that you can do to get connected here is actually before you even leave, in our lobby, we have a, a wall with people in blue shirts and pastors, and we just wanna meet you, have a conversation and help you get connected here because we truly believe as human beings, we are better when we're in community. We're better together. And so we're gonna push that. So it's our hope that before you even leave today, you have at least one meaningful interaction or conversation with another person because God works through us in community together. If you came here today and you were hoping to extend this time of worship with some prayer and communion, we do have a prayer team who's available at the front directly following the experience. And so as others are exiting out to the lobby, please join us at the front. We would love to pray with you, take communion with you, uh, and just continue in worship in that way. Another way that we uh, worship here is also through giving. And so first of all, I just wanna say thank you so much for your incredible generosity. Without the generosity of this church, uh, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. And so just know that it, it, it doesn't go unnoticed and we appreciate all who are giving because we just recognize that our hope is to impact not only eternity, but also make our world better while we're here. And you guys are a part of that. So if you wanna give, you can do so at the giving kiosk out in the lobby, the tip tap station out on your way through the exits or online centralcc.ca slash give and follow the prompts there and it'll guide you along. And that is all I have to share today. But if you have any questions about anything I said, how you can get connected, what it looks like to get connected, you can go to our website, centralcc.ca slash connect. You can text our number 905-937-5610, or uh, you can use that QR code on the seat back in front of you. Either way, it'll answer any questions you have. Uh, just know the truth is when we ask, God shows up. So I hope this week for you is your one more time week and honestly, uh, that you just begin to see what God is doing in your life because he's here. So God bless you all and we will see you next week. Have an amazing week, everybody.